Well, it is good to sit down with you today, Sarah Vianne. It's good to meet you today. Mm -hmm. And I've heard a lot about your story and what has brought you to this place of being an advocate uh, for more than just the unborn, but for human life. But I want to go back before we get to where you are today and uh, the message of this song and the message behind this song. I want to talk about where you come from. And music has been a huge part of your background, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I was born into a musical family. Mm -hmm. So I believe my mom was strumming her guitar while she was pregnant with me. And I think those, you know, those musical notes. Yes infiltrated into my my soul so yeah so music uh, was a big part of my life mm -hmm. my mom taught me everything about it how to harmonize and um, I'm the youngest of seven sisters so there's plenty of people to harmonize with. Yeah, that's right. Seven part harmony. Yeah. I've never heard it before. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> there's, there's some overlap, right? We tried that. It's very difficult. Yeah, though. You have a bass. <laughs> yeah. So. Me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're the bass. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember thinking when you you know when you grow up in a musical family, sometimes uh, you don't think about it as a kid. It's just part of the fabric of your yeah. family and of your growing up experience. Do you remember though, as a kid, thinking this is music is something that is resonating in a deeper place, maybe than what whatever else, dance or you yeah. know, or art or. Well, definitely. I mean, I was. I mean, constantly surrounded by music, and my mom could write a song, you know, in a drop of a hat. And I remember um, when I was four years old, I would grab her uh, little mini recorder. Remember those where you have to press the red button at the same time <laughs> yes, and record the cassette tape? Um, and, I would, and I would just grab her recorder and I would just find an empty cassette tape and uh, just make up words and songs. Like, and every song started with, I was walking down the road. And yeah, and so I just, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I was being like my mother. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> like mom. <laughs> yeah, like mom. Yeah. It was there a spiritual connection even at, you know, for a lot of people, music is this universal language. And even for people of all walks of life, all faith backgrounds, mm -hmm. music often has a connect for them. Do you remember that in your background as well growing up, that music was, a, was it a connection to God in a way? Well, definitely. I'm, you know, we would sing um, at church and um, my mom taught us all, you know, about the love of God and uh, gave us a great foundation of the Bible. So um, I could never escape it, really. Uh, but it was just, it was just naturally um, involved and in, in spiritually we connected, I connected uh, with uh, songwriting music with God, singing for Him. So take me down the road through high school and then going on past high school. What were your thoughts as far as career path and was music always a part of that trajectory too? I mean, growing up as a kid, I didn't think music would be uh, my focus, but um, 17, 18, uh, my voice started to blossom mm -hmm. and each sister was dethroned as a soloist. <laughs> and as the youngest, I yes, I rose to the occasion and uh, um, became the soloist um, and with my sister Lisa, who's three years older, and she, we would harmonize and my mom would highlight that. We had a recording studio in our house. Huh. Um, yeah, I thought music, you know, Seventh Heaven was going to be um, my career, um, even though I wanted to become, you know, a police officer. And But then I realized that you have to take cold showers and do numerous push-ups. And <laughs> so, yeah, so music, music was easier. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, harder, and, right? Yeah, right. Ways is learned. Yeah, right. Uh, did, did music give you um, a vehicle like, to communicate? Is that part of what... What was your experience with music? Why were you so drawn to songs, to songwriting, and even to performance? Well, I never thought that I could write a song mm -hmm. because um, my mom could do it so well. And I think I felt always inadequate that she could write better. And um, it was when uh, I turned 21 and I got my first guitar. And um, I wrote a song for my cat, Punky. <laughs> and I realized, oh, I could put a little jingle together, um, even though it was, you know, cute and a little foolish. But uh, I never saw myself as a songwriter um, mm -hmm. until I went to the country of Romania and experienced depth. Mm -hmm. So bring me, talk about Romania. You say, I mean, you say that almost like an afterthought until I yeah. got to Romania. <laughs> yeah. But so what took you from the States to Romania, which of course I know this 
but that's where you've spent the last 15 years yeah. of your life. Yeah. Uh, the calling of God. I was searching for my calling. I was searching for identity. Um, I was searching for a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing up in uh, my family, I was born a Christian, raised, you know, mm -hmm. Christian, you know, just, um, you know, I, I knew who, who Jesus was here, but I think at that point, it wasn't in my heart, and I wanted to develop a more personal relationship with Jesus. Um, but I was lost, and um, uh, it was not until my uh, advisor suggested Youth with a Mission, YOM. So it's a discipleship training school about missions. You learn about God, and you go on an outreach. Um, that's, uh, that was basically my calling to Europe, and the story goes from there. <laughs> so YOM got you connected to Romania. Was that your first mission with them, was to go to Romania? No. Okay. Uh, so you could choose any school okay. around the world, and um, I chose England. Okay. Um, and I uh, completed my discipleship training school, six months, uh, made my, my worldview broaden, my Christian worldview broaden, mm -hmm. and it challenged me, and um, I was challenged by the new worship songs I heard, and I was challenged by di different biblical beliefs. And, you know, these are people I was living with for six months, you know, Christians from around the world, and we're all, like, in this one, ho one house, house just, you know, crying over our issues and then, you know, <laughs> realizing God is there to heal. So um, we all grew, and it was such a wonderful, it was such an awesome time because I was so... I was so focused on, you know, just my family life mm -hmm. and with my sisters and my mom and dad. Um, it just, yeah, I, I felt like I stepped out into the world and stepped out of the boat and really into God's arms. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll never forget someone tapped me on my shoulder as I, as I was walking the streets in London, um, as I was sharing with my friends some, some of my spiritual struggles and concerns about the future. And this person said, you know, Sorry, I don't mean to butt in, but I just felt like God told me to tell you that the Christian life will never be easy. That was it, huh? And I was like, Period. really? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's new. But no, um, <laughs> yeah. but that, that equipped me um, for the trials ahead. In a way, did that comment give you, that simple statement give you permission to maybe be less afraid of your Christian faith not answering every problem in your life? Yeah, it, it just made me aware that, you know, that, you know, the Christian life is not a playground. You know, it's a battlefield. And um, just, I think just to, a reminder to hold up my shield of faith a lot more. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I've always had a warrior type of... Mm -hmm. Demeanor and you know, I was you know, I'm the fighter, you know, just I was the defender of the defenseless in school I would sit with the kids that were being bullied and you know, I I just had that within me I always wanted to fight against injustices and um, Yeah, I, I just I think it just prepared me to that um, God was just saying there's a battle in front of you mm -hmm. and Still is today. <laughs> it sounds like even as a child you talk about you know, kind of sitting with the kid who might be bullied and, and, and putting the shield of protection around people mm -hmm. so that they have a place to thrive. Sounds like that's kind of always been in you. Yeah. That warrior mentality. Yeah. That translated into your experience with in Romania. Right. Tell right. me about that experience in Romania, what you've been doing the past 15 years and who you've been partnering with, not organizationally, but like the people and, and their right. places of life. Right. Well, I never intended to um, start a nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, but God had his plans, obviously. So, um, you know, primarily we work with children that have been abandoned, orphan children, and children that are segregated. Um, they're Roma children, otherwise known as gypsy. Um, this ethnicity is, um, yeah, highly segregated. Um, they originated from Pakistan hundreds of years okay. ago. Romania has one of the highest populations of, of these people. Of Roma people. Roma people. Um, they live in third world conditions. Uh, most are unemployed, um, uneducated, and uh, basically cast aside. Mm -hmm. So um, our focus 
And my focus over the past 15 years has been to um, justify um, these children that will one day be Romania's future. Uh, and so it was in 2005 uh, when my colleague, Steffi Fogel, who's from the Black Forest, um, mm. Uh, we walked into um, State Children's Hospital in the city of Brasov, Romania, expecting just to sing Christmas carols for some kids that were left or abandoned. And what we found were rooms full of children wrapped in several layers of rags, tied by strings, used as diapers, alone in prison-like cribs. And um, you can imagine it was pretty horrific to stumble <laughs> upon. And um, yeah, we knew we had to intercept this hopelessness and uh, God, God placed on our hearts a plan and a fire. And the plan was to buy disposable diapers um, and uh, provide this for the kids, which became our free ticket of entry into this hospital, mm. a state hospital, mm. state hospital. Mm. And uh, yeah, so, you know, God uh, used two young girls to, you know, to keep on smiling, never point f fingers at the staff saying, oh, you know, don't, you know, mm -hmm. don't treat that child like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he just, he used two young, young girls that were not trained, mm -hmm. just trained in heart to have compassion and a fire um, to help humanity. What you're talking about is really giving voice to the voiceless. And that brings me to the song, the current song, I'm Alive, that you've written, which, yeah. uh, came from the perspective, uh, I mean, you're talking about unborn children here, the right of unborn children. And that seems to come from this, I mean, you talk about a life that, a voiceless life that doesn't have the ability to speak for themselves. This is one of the a primary examples. How did you kind of get involved, even just internally? When did you start to think about the voice of an unborn child. Right. When you say unborn, you know, I like to refer as a baby in the womb. Okay. Because either it's a baby or it's not a baby. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So how I was inspired, well, mm -hmm. let me go back to the 70s to my mother. And, uh, you know, she um, she was fighting against, you know, Roe versus Wade. She wrote a song. She mm -hmm. was in Faneuil Hall in Boston where I was born, um, you know, protect, trying to protect um, the uh, babies in the womb. And um, at that time, I mean, we didn't have, you know, media and, you know, mm -hmm. opportunities that we have now. And once again, I, my mom would always bring up this, this term and this situation. And it was here, but it wasn't here. Um, not until I understood really what was happening and the value of life and these precious little ones that just because they're, inside, you know, masked behind, you know, a layer of skin, they're not a baby and they have no rights. And, you know, I deal with babies, children fresh from the womb that have been abandoned um, in the children's hospital. And, you know, and I, I feel their warm breath, you know, on my face and I see them staring up and trying to grab my hands, you know, so um, I understood the, the value of life um, through my experiences. Mm -hmm. So how I was led by God to write the song, I'm Alive, uh, I was in Pennsylvania um, at a pregnancy resource center um, that was founded by uh, close friends of mine. And I was so moved by what they were doing. You know, they were um, counseling with mothers, you know, about, you know, their baby in their womb and that they're alive and, mm -hmm. um, and that this is the most precious gift that God could give you. And um, after wa walking out, I, I, I turned to Sandy and I said, I, I want to write a song. I want to write a song for, you know, your organization. Then uh, I went back to Romania, um, in Brasov. That's usually where the magic of songwriting happens for me. <laughs> uh, I wanted to depict the child speaking to the mother saying, I'm alive. Give me a chance. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the song is not to point fingers, not to say, you're bad, mm -hmm. you're wrong. It's to say, you know, the child loves you and give, the ch give this child a chance that wants to be named by you, wants to cuddle you. Um, it's, it's a song about love. It's a song about healing. We live in a really politically charged society. You know, yeah. everything becomes political at some, every conversation becomes political at some point in time. 
But what I hear you talking about is it being a more personal matter yeah. and how we've talked about this is not just reciting some statistics. It's not just saying, you know, here's all the people providing abortions and here's how to stop them providing yeah. abortions. You're talking and speaking to a mother and her child. Why the difference in philosophy there? Like that's a very different approach. It's just a very, it's a much more personal approach. We can go pick it all day long, what we don't agree with, right? But you're saying, no, this is a human, this is not a political matter specifically. It is a human matter. Right. Everybody, you know, we all want to be loved. We want to be respected. We all have different opinions. Because mm. love is what makes the world go around. God is love. He created us in his image and he is the God of love. We are love. If we can soften through love a heart that is fearful, you know, then um, a choice can be made for life. You don't want anything pushed on you. If anything's pushed on me, I back off. Mm. And I don't want to push an opinion, especially with religion. You know, I never want, you know, I'm not that type of like, love Jesus, you know, God is love, you know, listen, you're going to go to hell and all that if you don't accept Jesus as Lord, you know, no, that's not the way, you know, you, you share by, you know, have you ever felt alone? Have you ever felt unwanted? Have you ever felt disrespected? And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I just wanted to bring in that, that style of music, mm -hmm. reverse psychology. Mm -hmm. go underneath. Well, reverse psychology or maybe pure psychology, yeah. because, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's you're true. talking about a partnership yeah. with people rather than Rather than, like you said, waving the finger, uh, when we realize we're not alone, we feel supported. And when we feel supported, yeah. I believe that we're then able to make decisions out of a more pure motive, purely yeah. motivated place. Because when we feel supported, we feel less afraid. And right, and fear is such a unhealthy driver, and we've all experienced fear in our lives. Uh, you know, what would you say to a mother who has a baby in her womb? that so an expecting mother um, who finds herself in a circumstance that um, that she is becoming a mother through a circumstance that was not her primary choice or option or um, maybe even um, through trauma she has become pregnant how do you express not just your belief, but your desire for her. What is your desire for her and that baby? That they can bond and have a relationship and that that mother can understand the value and how precious that gift that she has inside her womb and that that baby, that baby inside wants to be loved and deserves a chance. It's also human rights is what you're talking about. Too. Mm -hmm. You're talking more than right. baby's rights and the way that you're talking about mothers. And I do know the psychological and emotional trauma sometimes doesn't appear for decades, mm -hmm. but uh, does always appear in someone, in a mother who has exercised abortion. So if you're thinking about, I'm thinking of how what you're talking about is also it's not just care for the baby. Mm -hmm. It's holistic care for the mother. Right. I mean, I'm so glad that my mother um, made the choice to keep you know, my older sister. You know, my, my parents, they got, uh, yeah, they, uh, my mom became pregnant um, when she was very young, 16. And, uh, and um, you know, she was Catholic in Boston, pressured to basically say, abort your baby or, or I'll send you to the convent. <laughs> And uh, thank God, um, my parents both decided, you know, to have my sister Tina, and she's living. And my sister, she has a big heart, um, and she is an advocate for pro-life, you know, because she always says, you know, I could have been um, aborted. My colleague in Romania, Steffi from Germany, you know, her parents had her very young, and she was supposed to be aborted. So it affects me. I, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm personally affected by it and um, and that's why it's important um, you know with the song I mean do you believe a song can save a life I think music has proven that time and time again right mm -hmm. right so that's what that's what uh, music is so powerful and that's what I'm alive is about it's a song that can save not just one life maybe millions but what is the value on saving one life can you place a value? 
So I, it's not, yeah, success is not all about numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, you know, it's a personal thing. It's a personal subject. Um, I will fight for justice. I've always said that. It, when I was a child, I, w I would stand in the gap for those kids that, you know, didn't have the voice or the strength or the confidence. I wanted to be their confidence. I, you know, I, I was a protector of my sisters, you know, even though I was the youngest. You know, I, you know, I was, they always say Sarah's a little bodyguard, even though, you know, I was the tallest, even though I'm only five foot four and a half, you know, I'm like tall compared to my family. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, still to, the, to this day, I'm, I want to protect them. I want to protect all innocent life. You know, I help rescue orphans in the orphanage, you know, who are now 16. I first, you know, they're, they were you know, nine months, six months. You know, I've, I've, I've done that. I've proven that I'm not just somebody that just talks. And also to say, I just wrote a song about pro-life because I want to hop on this train and this subject. No, this, this, this has always been um, in me. This is what the calling that God has placed in my heart is to be a megaphone for the voiceless. And I'm doing this through music and the arts. And that's what Sarah Vienna Ministries is all about. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope uh, through music, um, people will make the right choices and it'll be such a way that, you know, they would say, oh, you know, I want to protect, you know, my child or you know, I want to protect the elderly or, yeah. If we are, have been moved by God in his love for us, and if we are created in his image and he is loving, and so therefore we, as, as perfect image bearers, would be loving, then is this not just going back to love God and love one another? Mm -hmm. Isn't this that at yeah. its most basic principle? I mean, God created us in his image. I mean, that's, he, he created us to live and um, he created us to worship him. And, you know, I always think about you know, we're on, you know, we're just walking on this earth for so long. And what is life about? Life is about loving one another and, and helping, assisting humanity. And I, you know, what are you doing to help humanity? What, what, what is life all about? Just to live, to die? Mm. You know, and if God cre created human beings in his image, you know, he created them to live. He created life to live. Mm -hmm. And um, and I understand that if, you know, you don't understand that, why you can make choices, mm -hmm. you know, not to have your baby. I understand that, you know, and, but that's what this song, I'm Alive, is supposed to do is to say, you know, I am here deep inside you. Um, you can't see me, but I'm alive. And so I hope this song can bring the further understanding of the value and the precious gift. I mean, so many children, you know, there's, there's so many, you know, mothers or, or women that cannot have children and, um, you know, they'll give anything to have a baby. And um, I just hope that, that mothers can understand um, how fortunate they are, they, they are when, you know, they have a moving, breathing, heartbeat inside of them. What a gift. I am here deep inside you. You can't see me, but I am 